Good evening. I have the lovely Mark with me. Hi, Mark. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello. Um, yes, I'm Mark Edwards. I write psychological thrillers. I have written, I actually find it hard to count, but I've written around 20 now uh, that have been published. Uh, my most well-known books are The Magpies, Follow Your Home, Here to Stay, and my most recent book is called The Darkest Water, which is a crime thriller slash psychological thriller set in the Lake District. Um, what else do you need to know? I live in Wolverhampton. I've got two cats, a retriever. I live with my wife and my three kids. And I've been writing full time for about 11 years now. So making a living doing it. So, yeah. And and the struggle is real. It still goes <laughs> on. <laughs> I know. It's a crazy thing to decide to do. And yet, fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's, I do, it's still my dream job. I mean, I dreamed of being a writer since I was a teenager, really. I, felt, I tried to write a book when I was about 16. In fact, I did manage to write a whole novel, but like longhand. It was absolutely terrible and it is thankfully it's long lost it will never see the light of day um and then when i left university in my early 20s um i started writing again and i had a terrible day job like working customer services which i really hated um but i didn't want a proper job because i wanted to be a writer and i wanted to I wanted to put most of my creative energy into writing novels and trying to trying to pursue that as a as a career. It, but it just took me a very long time before I ever made any money from it and was able to do it full time. But yeah, I do, I do, um, although we often kind of moan about about uh, well, publishing and writing and and um actually having to sit down and write words every day, it's um it's still my dream job and I do really love it. And I and I have to uh, remind myself frequently how lucky I am to be doing to be doing this. So so yeah, I'm I would never want to do to go back to working in, in an office, which I did for like 20, 20 years before I started doing this. Yeah, I've um just got out the head of retail so I can relate. <laughs> right. Yeah, now I'm in a call centre, which is a little bit better. Yeah, <laughs> I, well, I used to work in it. I used to do that. I used to work in a call centre. I did it for um, a rail company. They don't exist anymore. They were called Connex, and they were we covered the southeast of England. And so I would sit there all day listening to people complaining about their late trains, pigeons dying on the platforms, blocked toilets. Uh, leaves on the line, <laughs> rude stuff, uh, everything, gates that have been locked when they shouldn't have been, everything that you could think, buses, engineering works for the bane of my life, everything you could think of. It, honestly, it was the worst job. People got so angry and they'd be on their mobiles calling live from the train. This was kind of when mobiles were just starting to come in, like the late 90s. And they'd be ringing me saying, I need the toilet. And all the toilets on the train are locked. What are you going to do about it? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd have to ring the train, the conductor, and try and, and say, is there anything you can do about the about unlocking one of the toilets? Anyway, that's what my life was like when I worked in a call centre. It was really stressful. So I'm very happy that I don't. Yeah. I hope customers are nicer than that. Well, weirdly, we have a, a link to trains, although that, thankfully we don't have people ringing us live on trains about that, but we yeah. do deal with cleaning, so we do hear about dead pigeons and dead foxes quite often. Mm. Um, which foxes. Is, yeah. Um, and people trying to commit suicide as well, so that's fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 It's not all like yeah. that. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Um it's it's I think it's actually quite a common thing for people in the in the arts who, who are pursuing anything creative or artistic to do I mean the cliche 
is if you work in Hollywood or somewhere, you're going to be waiting tables or working at McDonald's or something. But working in call centres seems to be second, second behind that. For, as a and accountants, I find there's yeah. a lot of accountants come authors. I don't really know why that is. The principal, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And lawyers, but they, I mean, they're making they're making good money. <laughs> yeah, 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 they're doing all right. <laughs> um, yeah. was there a, a point where you thought, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna take it seriously, I'm really gonna try and write a book that I'm gonna submit or was it just a constant process until you finally got that book that worked and got no well I mean I was doing it I'm the very actually the so the, I mentioned before when I tried to write a book when I was 16 but then when I was in my early 20s it must have been about 23 um and I'd graduated from university I wrote another book and again I wrote it longhand and I got to the end and I thought it's not actually good enough to type up but it kind of showed me that I could write like I don't know 80,000 words or something I think it was so then I started to take it seriously I wrote another book which I actually um I used to have this thing called a sharp font writer which was kind of like an electronic typewriter which you put floppy disks into I know so this is so long ago this is in the mid 90s um and you could only see like three or four lines of text at a time on this tiny little green it was like a little green screen this is pre-internet as well um and you'd have to fit when you wanted to print you'd have to feed paper into it one sheet at a time so it used to take <laughs> it used to take all day to print a manuscript and then I'd have to take them down to the photocopier shop if I needed copies um anyway so I did that and I started sending out uh, synopses and sample chapters I had the I've got one here actually somewhere else. It's, it's slightly beyond my reach a, a writers and artists um handbook which is still going um and uh yeah I but it took me year I was doing that for years maybe three or four years and writing three or four different novels before I finally found an agent. This was about 1998 or something, I think I found an agent. And then um, she she was very confident that she would be able to sell this book that I'd written. And I was really excited thinking it was, it was finally going to happen, thinking that three or four years at this point was a long time. Um, and it didn't. She just couldn't sell the book. I got lots of nice, nice rejections. <laughs> and um, and then I wrote another one and she couldn't sell that either. And then I wrote another one and it carried on like that. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, I eventually met Louise Voss and we started writing books together. This was in the 2000s. And um, again we still couldn't get a publisher so we eventually decided to self-publish and that was in 2011 and um, we published two books called Catch Your Death and Killing Cupid they did really well we got to number one and number two on Amazon and that led to us getting a new agent and a book deal with uh, HarperCollins and um, we had a few books with them then I self-published The Magpies so I went back to doing that um and after that was was a hit I got picked up by Amazon Publishing uh, Tom Mercer, which is their crime imprint and I was then with them for 10 years um I still have one more book to come out with them actually and I just signed with Michael Joseph which is part of Penguin Random House so so yeah, it's uh, it's been a really really long journey with lots of ups and downs <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this new deal that I've just signed. I mean, the yeah, book won't be out. Until... That's amazing. Thank, thank you. Uh, it won't be out until next summer, 2025. Um, but yeah, it's it's really exciting because um, I will finally have a hardback, and um, hopefully, I mean, the great Amazon are brilliant at selling books and selling eBooks. Um, 
but it's been a kind of source of frustration over the years that I've rarely seen my books in shops. Um, and I mean, my local Waterstone stocks stocks my books, and there's some like independent bookshops that sell them. But generally, I, I never see them. Uh, they just sell on Amazon. And um, so, yeah, if touch wood, fingers crossed, everything going well, they will, this one, the wasp trap is going to be called, will end up in in shops um, in hardback, like I said. So, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all very exciting. But oh. it's taken me, yeah, 20, I mean, it must be almost exactly 20 years since I wrote that first that first novel and started trying to submit to agents. Yeah, that's, yeah I'm got... impressed. I don't know as though I would have stuck it out that long with that many rejections and stuff. I'm like, oh, so I'm impressed that you yeah. kept going and kept going. Like, so yeah, you definitely well, did the, <laughs> the big deal and stuff at the end. I can't, I mean, it might be a sign of madness that I kept <laughs> going for so long. <laughs> Just sheer bloody mindedness. And I, I mean, I've I, I've said this before, but I sometimes think if there'd been a kind of Simon Cowell figure, he'd said to me quite early on, look, it's just not worth the grief. Just give, don't give up your day job and <laughs> and, it, and it's not going to happen for you. I might have given up, but I just kept getting little bits of encouragement. Um, so there were books that came close to getting published. And like I said, I had an agent and so on. I had short stories published and, and I always got like good feedback from people that were rejecting me saying he's a good writer, but it's, this book is just not quite what we're looking for at the moment. Um. So, so yeah, but and in fact, there was about a period of four or five years where I did, where I did stop and I didn't do any writing at all. And I just thought, well, I've given it a good shot and I'm going to, I'm going to stop now. Um, that would have been in the mid 2000s um and i had a proper job by then which did take up all my energy my creative energy and i didn't have anything left for writing and it was only when self publishing became an option in 2010 2011 that i thought that was the i just thought let's give it a go and see what happens and it worked amazingly well so yeah, I only had, I think I had six months and even by then I was like, oh no, I hate this. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's just, I think, I, the, 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 the important thing I think is that I do really enjoy the writing itself. And if I didn't like um, coming up with these ideas and writing these stories and and actually kind of being in front of my keyboard nearly every or every weekday anyway writing and and still getting very excited about ideas and, and coming up with lots of ideas then I wouldn't do it if I hate if I hated writing and just wanted to be published then that would just, that would be insanity yes. because you've got to really love doing it I saw somebody say that writing is unusual as a kind of a creative hobby because it's the only one where you kind of expect it to turn into like a job or something that you're going to make money. For. If you enjoy playing the piano, for example, you don't expect to become a concert pianist and to put on concerts for people. If you, um, if you like painting, you probably don't think that you're going to be a great artist and have exhibitions and so but anyone who ever writes anything who writes fiction thinks oh yeah this should be published people are going to want to read this they it's quite rare for writers to just write for pure enjoyment where actually we might all be a lot happier <laughs> and if, <laughs> if more of us did more of us did that but but no from i mean i i just always wanted from when i was young to be to have that thing where i had I had a book with my name on the cover and, and people could walk in WH Smith's and, and buy it. So, um, but along the way I did, I have actually, and I still enjoy the process of writing itself. And I love reading. I love books. I love going into bookshops 
I, I'm never happier than I'm wandering around a bookshop. Um, I buy way more books than I ever have time to read, <laughs> like most of us. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and I just love being part of that world as well, like meeting other writers and going to festivals and doing events and meeting readers and chatting to, to readers online. Um, I just did a, I just had the dream gig where I got asked to be a guest author at a, a, re a reading retreat in Greece. I don't yes. think reading. It's very jealous that. of this, yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was amazing. They basically <laughs> had about 30 people there who mostly from America who would come over with their Kindles loaded up or they had paid print books. And, and everyone there was like a really keen reader, like psychological thrillers. And I was I was one of the guest authors, um, and it was like an all expenses paid trip. Um, yeah, and and I loved it. I just loved kind of mingling and mixing with these these readers and and chatting with them, and and it's um, it I, I I like doing anything like that in like where you're. Yeah, it looked terrible. Me. I don't know how you coped. <laughs> Yeah, but even if it had been <laughs> kind of rainy, if it had been on the Isle of Wight and it had been raining, I probably would have enjoyed it. <laughs> huh? would have, you totally would have. But yeah, it did you know the blue seas, the blue skies? It, did, yeah, it looked awful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a bit hot. <laughs> <laughs> How do you tell uh, that to your wife? You're like, oh, by the way, I'm just off to Greece for a few days for a reading retreat. <laughs> Well, she's very cool about all these things. She's very she she goes away and does her own stuff. So um I mean when I when I got offered the the gig, I was like, um I mentioned it to her and she's like, Yeah, you should go. That sounds great. So I think she just likes to get rid of me for a week. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um was it always yeah. crime for you of the psychological thrillers? Was it always Sorry. crime you wanted to write? Oh. Well, I, mean, I think this is one of the reasons why it took me a while to get published, because when I started, I didn't really know what kind of books I was writing or that I wanted to write. I think I saw them as more general fiction. I think the first book I wrote, in fact, was more of a kind of satire. Um, and then the second one would have been very much influenced by the secret history which is my favorite book um so i would have kind of slightly pretentiously i would have thought of it as a literary thriller it probably wasn't a literary thriller it was just a thriller um and and then the next one had a little bit of science fiction kind of mixed in with it and and then when i wrote the magpies i actually thought of it as a horror novel so i thought that this is psychological horror and that that was what I was setting out to do was to kind of be because Steve when I was growing up like 99% of writers that you talk to Stephen King was my was my hero and I wanted to do what he did to write these stories about ordinary people in scary situations but I made I set a rule for myself that there would be nothing supernatural happening in the books it all had to be it, it all had to be able to happen in real life um so so yeah the magpies when i wrote it i thought this is this is psychological horror um and this was around the time when there's a bit of a horror boom because the sixth sense had just come out and the blair witch project this is so this was yeah i wrote the magpies in 1999 i think when those films both came out um and uh it was only later that I thought, actually, this is a psychological thriller. Um, the thing it lacks as a psychological thriller is it doesn't have a big twist at the end because it actually has more of a horror. I mean, this is spoilery, but most people who are going to read The Magpies have probably read it now. <laughs> it kind of follows a, a kind of horror plot trajectory, which is more about the accumulation of dread and things just getting worse and worse and worse and worse rather than oh there's going to be a big twist or a big reveal at the end 
it, the, the people who you think are the baddies really are the baddies all the way through. So um, that's the only one of my books that's like that. All the others have got loads of twists and it's the thing I really kind of try and focus on now because people people who read these kind of books demand twists. Um, but the magpies, the twist is there is no twist. <laughs> it's just what you think. It just gets worse. It just keeps getting worse <laughs> until it reaches a, a kind of a, a, a climax. So, so yeah, it's not you find out that there was an unreliable narrator or anything like that. It, it is. It is what it what it looks like from the start. So, so yeah, um, and. And then some of the books that I've written have been more crime, like more police procedural. So, for example, The Darkest Water, which is the new one, um, I brought back my detective character from The Lucky Ones, who's called Imogen Evans, um, who I really love writing, actually, because I find her... It sounds weird when you talk about writing characters as if they're real, but when you get into some characters' heads, you just immediately kind of switch into that that mode of thinking so with her um I just find her really funny and I find it easy to come up with jokes and and um little sarcastic asides and she's very ironic so um I really enjoy writing her and she's a she's a detective who in the lucky ones um was on the trail of a serial killer who who made his victims' lives uh, happy before he killed them. That was his kind of, his, uh, his MO. Um, and in The Darkest Water, there's a, a man is, is found on a beach in the Lake District, buried up to his neck uh, and left to drown as the tide comes in. That's how the book starts. And they, they quickly discover that he was like this hermit who lived in a house in the woods nearby but nobody really knows who he was or where he came from he was completely living off grid so she has to set out to first of all find out who he was and then try and figure out why somebody would have wanted to kill him in such a terrible terrible way so you've got a subplot going on with uh, a guy called calvin who runs a bakery in a nearby village and he's attracted a social media stalker had uh, this woman who keeps DMing him and is obs slightly obsessed with him. <laughs> and he's very naive and he kind of invites her into his life, much to his wife's absolute horror, like befriending oh. your stalker. <laughs> and then um, and then eventually these two stories like intersect um, around halfway through the book. And yeah, it was really, it was really good fun to write actually. So I like, I like kind of moving around between the different subgenres of crime and psychological thriller and domestic noir and and um, action. One of them was like more of an action thriller. I've written about cults a couple of times. I think it kind of make, keeps it interesting for me to keep moving around between the different different. Uh, subgenres of which there are many yes yeah, so many <laughs> mm. yeah and I think that's one of the things that makes the, the genre so interesting and dynamic is that within this kind of set of rules that you've got where usually somebody's murdered or somebody goes missing I mean those are the two main storylines um you've got this this kind of great infinite variation of of stories um and also crime and thrillers allow us to write about the world as it is now and to and to write about things that that are actually happening and often i think there's a, there's a kind of a scramble or to to kind of write about these hot topics first <laughs> uh, because, and then you'll see suddenly like loads of books will come out at the same time with the same theme and everyone's like hang on I was I'm writing that book how come that how come you're doing that as well this has happened to me a few times 
but it's because we're all kind of um we're all influenced by the same culture the same news the same um the put the kind of cult the culture around us and we're all getting ideas from the same the same places so for example talking of greece um there's been like this weird um uh what's the word just there's just been lots of people going missing hiking in greece over, in the last month so there was the famous is it michael mosley yeah the tv presenter um and then somebody went missing on the island that i was actually on just after i left and then there was one or two on the, no the next island over and i think there was another thing there was like four all within like a week or two of each other and then you've got this one in Tenerife as well, which has just happened with this young guy. It's really weird. Like, why is this happening? But the the crime writer in me thinks, oh, yeah, that's awful. Mm, isn't that a great idea for a book? <laughs> like, why are all these people going missing on hikes at the same time? There must be a story in that. But you can guarantee that I'm not going to be the only person who's thinking <laughs> of that. Yes. So if I, if I do write that book, and I probably won't because... I've got too many other things to do. You, I bet there'll be a few other books that will come out at the same time about people going missing. In fact, there have been a few hike books. Susie Holiday wrote one, and um, uh, um, Lucy, um, oh my God, my mind's gone blank, who wrote The Castaways. Um, it will come back to me in a minute anyway. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a few hiking, hiking thrillers come out in the last few years. So yeah. Um, a question I quite well that actually does interest me. Um, do you stick to the same sort of? Do you have like a favourite kill method when you co commit murder? In oh, <laughs> or do you try and do it differently each time? <laughs> That's a really good question. I have never been asked that before, but I do have. I do think about it quite a lot because actually, yes, I do. I'm always pushing people off of things, <laughs> pushing people off of high places. Um. I think when you set books in the UK and there's not that many guns around and you don't want to have everyone being stabbed and poisoning is very kind of Agatha Christie. <laughs> there's there's only that there's not that many ways that you can murder people. And um so and also when you push people downstairs or off of a cliff or off of a tall building, it's quite easy to make it look like it wasn't actually murder it's quite ambiguous so it could have been suicide or an accident so yeah I've had a lot of people falling off of falling from great heights <laughs> in my books I don't know I, I'm actually slightly scared of heights as well actually so maybe that's why I really hate things like you know like go eight where people go up into the trees and walk across ropes and things I've done that before because I hated it absolutely hated yeah, I it I can't trick my brain. I can't, I can't tell my brain that I'm not going to fall. My brain's going, you're going to fall, you're going to fall. <laughs> Even though you're kind of like, you've got a harness on. And um, and I've had quite a lot of people drowning in my books as well. So drowning and falling from heights. Yeah, they're my, they're my favourite murder methods. <laughs> Yes. You've got fire and you've got yeah, oh, yeah, that's fire, yeah. Suffocating yeah. as well. Being injected with morphine overdoses in one of the books. <laughs> um and yeah, there's actually been a lot of fires. Yeah, here to stay there's a fire, the magpies there's a fire. Um oh my god, I can't even remember all the different <laughs> <laughs> the different murders um yeah but like i said i mean there's not there's there's only a limited number of ways that you can kill people but yeah i mean it i do try and think of original ways for people to to go but you don't want to kind of go like midsummer murders and just be <laughs> so <vague. laughs> bizarre so one of the most original that i've heard and i kept forgetting who it was but it's sean campbell um, he um, bashed someone over the head so that they'd be taken to hospital. When they got to hospital, they'd need the um, MRI, but they'd put 
ball bearings inside the person. So when they went into the MRI, obviously the magnets would, you know. Oh, God. And yeah, so I was um, like, that's pretty grim, but actually very inventive. <laughs> somebody, somebody, when I was in Greece, somebody told me these these are crime. These people read a lot of crime books. They said the worst apparently the worst way to die is to be be cut open, but not enough so it kills you. Smeared with honey, and then put in a boat, tied down in the boat, and then set out to sea in, in like under a hot sun. And because you would just, it would take you a very long time to die. Well, I guess you, I don't know whether you would die first before you died or anything else, but apparently that is the worst way to die. So there you go. I don't I love know what you're talking about, big greens. <laughs> Uh, how would you find that out i don't <laughs> well i suppose they've used their yeah they 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 kind of imagine what's the worst way to go i mean i think the the nicest would way i mean the actually that the luck so the lucky ones which is one of the morphine injections that book actually got banned in korea <laughs> um when i say banned i had a i had a publishing contract for it um and then the publisher at the last minute said, we've decided that we can't publish it because it's too disturbing or it's too um, it's too controversial because there was a lot of stuff going on in South Korea at the time with, I think, people dying of like um, overdoses of opioids. And they just thought, so, so yeah, that was really weird. They basically, I still kept the money from the advance, but the contract was cancelled and then it went to another publisher in the end so yeah that was <laughs> that was my experience of being really controversial being being banned by my own publisher <laughs> i i mean it was really I, I, you'd never have guessed because i thought well that's they're all dying in quite a nice pain this way in that book yeah i know yeah. that's yeah that's not that bad but well, there you go <laughs> yeah um, what are your most overused um, words and phrases when you're writing? Oh, uh, it's the same as everyone. Look, look is the is the biggest one. Eyes, um, just nodded, shook his head, all those kind of things that everybody does all the time. I mean, anything to do with eyes, um, because when I'm writing scenes, you've got characters communicating. You don't want to keep writing said. And I think the characters, the way that I picture the characters, they do a lot of stuff, a lot of communicating with their eyes and the way they're looking at each other. And getting that across without keep writing, he looked at her, or he blinked, or whatever. It's it's really, it's quite hard. So I have to go through and take out like hundreds of references to uh, to looking and, and uh, staring and gazing and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah any any kind of way of looking at somebody there's always hundreds of references to that in my books um and you have to take them out yeah um i think we're all the same actually most because i that's to get the kind of rhythm of the dialogue especially in dialogue scenes right you do have to put you put in like those little bits like he he took a sip from his glass or whatever all those little things that you put in and also I find it there's uh, there's only so many ways you can say somebody's blood ran cold or somebody <laughs> felt scared or they or they um so yeah writing I find writing physical reactions to be really challenging to not just keep repeating repeating yourself. Yeah, I mean I know difficult. like as a writer it's hard, but one of my pet hates as a reader is padded. They padded across yeah. the room. No, you didn't. You just walked. Like, yeah, I see that. I, I know. <laughs> I know people hate that, and so I don't use it. I've never. I don't think I've, I. Might, I probably did use it early on, but I haven't used it for years. Um, dust smoke, floating in sunlight is another one that people use a lot. And that phrase, I let out of breath. I didn't realize I was holding. I didn't know I was holding. <laughs> I have. I'm very proud. That I've never used that. <laughs> <laughs> There's there's a group a Facebook group for psychological thriller readers where they talk about that all the time. It's really funny. Although people are always looking out for I found one. 
yeah um yeah there are i think we've all got little pegs and you kind of know you might notice like a tick that a writer's got where they use certain phrases over and over and you once you notice it then you can't unnotice it and it gets quite yeah it's <laughs> like when you, if you have a friend or somebody who always uses a certain phrase like do you know what i mean or not being funny about or whatever people or things people like that people say all the time um <laughs> then you, it starts to go great on your nerves after a while <laughs> i used to work in this office where where there was like an epidemic of people saying not being funny but and i must have heard it like 200 times a day and then by the end of the day i'd be like <laughs> if i hear that one more time i'm gonna scream i'm gonna scream <laughs> yes yes Mm. Um, I used to work... it's quite annoying. Yeah, I used to work for Greg. So if I never hear the question, is it hot one more time in my life, it will still be too soon. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, that, but you do have to ask that though in Greg's, don't you? You do have to ask that. But we when can't I... answer it. <laughs> we couldn't answer. We're not allowed to say it's hot because of the like the law and around VAT and selling hot food and stuff so we couldn't oh, really oh, they do it they do hear when you ask and they like touch it's easier. It <laughs> because it's easier just to tell people but yeah I know <laughs> um I know I mean this is so off topic it's hilarious but it's like when you go to Sainsbury's and they say have you got a nectar card would you like a bag um I, tr I try to preempt because I, I feel I feel so sorry for the people having to say that 5,000 times a day. I say, I've got an extra card and I don't need a bag, like as soon as I go up. Yeah, I'm so cool and nice. <laughs> um, do you put any secret jokes, messages or Easter eggs in your books? Yeah, they've all got Easter eggs. Um, they're just references to other books so um and so, i mean not all of the books but most of them have got either um a mention of lucy newton who's the baddie in in the magpie she crops up a lot um and there's a in the retreat there's a book that the main character has written called sweet neat and that book has been mentioned in lots of my other books with people reading it in one of them it's been adapt it's been made into a netflix adaptation one of the characters is acting in in the adaptation and then in another of the books someone's watching the netflix adaptation of that <laughs> book um and there's there's um there's references to like the shropshire viper who is the serial killer in the lucky ones in in a couple of the books yeah i really enjoy putting all of that, that stuff in i mean i think the hollows has got six or seven easter eggs in it and it's also got stephen king easter eggs in it as well so i because it's kind of like my tribute to stephen king and because it's set in maine so for example there's a cat in it called cujo and <laughs> there's various little kind of i mean that's a very obvious one but there's various little little references that stephen king readers would would spot as well as lots of references to my own books i just yeah i just find it really really good fun and i'll put at the end of the book like there are six or seven easter eggs in this book if you can't spot them all then email me and i'll tell you what they are so it's quite a nice way to get people to email you as well i can't imagine but, you're that short of people contacting you are you <laughs> no no i get quite a lot i get quite a lot but not too many to not too many that i can't cope <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah like i said i like i like hearing from people um and it kind of ebbs when you've got when a new book's come out and it's selling quite well then you'll get a lot more messages sometimes a bit quiet so yeah but but i do i mean i can't imagine what it must have been like being a writer 25 30 years ago before the internet when people would have to write you letters that must have been really and you wouldn't you wouldn't have contact with your with your readers um you wouldn't really know how your book was being received 
you might get, if you were lucky, you might get some reviews in a newspaper or a magazine or something. You could go to events and kind of meet people, but generally the book would come out and that would be it. You would have no idea what people <laughs> thought of it, which you could say was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Because I had some, I mean, I've had some shocking reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, but that just goes to the territory. But I'm, it's, it's, um, I'd much rather live in the world where I can see that people are reading the books and see what they think of them, um, than kind of living in this kind of void of and having to reply to letters. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> No. I can't. I mean, people used to do it though, because you sometimes see these letters come up where so and so wrote to Ernest Hemingway and he wrote them a nice letter back or something. I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean, I guess these big writers had secretaries or whatever doing it for them, but but uh, yeah. Have you I... ever seen um, Mark Billingham read out letters and stuff at, at festivals? He's got actual letters, I think, because obviously he's been going for years, isn't he? So. He's got uh, actual proper letters from readers, and he reads I've them out. I've seen him kind of read out some of his 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 reviews and things, but I haven't seen the letters. <laughs> so. yeah, I saw him do it with John Connolly at um Capital yeah. Crime. So they both, I think, had actual proper letters. <laughs> right, mad ones. Yeah, old oh, mental, yeah. absolutely yeah. insane. <laughs> yeah, I've had a few. I've had a few really crazy ones. Really crazy. <laughs> um. And I mean, sometimes I also had like somebody get a tattoo of one of my characters, like a big tattoo. I was like on their leg. I was really flattered by that. That somebody liked that book enough that they would get it turned into a tattoo. Um, I don't know if you can see, but this this tattoo, this image in the middle is from um, a book that started my whole crazy book journey. So it's from the uh, cover of a book i can't actually see what it says see way of life reading is not a pastime it's a way of life it eases my soul and when i need it most it's a light in the dark i don't know what that's from what is it i don't know i just saw it and i liked it and i thought it was right but it's not the it's not a quote from the book but the image in the oh. middle is it's sorry it's from where I don't know where the where the quotes from. I just liked it, but just I just wanted a book image in the middle, oh, so right. I decided to have right. have the image of the book that I quite I class as started my journey of being a blogger and everything else. Okay, and it's an author that no one's really heard of because he's self published and stuff. So yeah, okay. he's very touched that I've got his book tattooed on me. <laughs> I saw some I got Chris Carter's signature um, tattooed on them as well. Really? Yeah. He's such a he's such a huge kind of rock star of an author. I know he actually used to be a rock star. Yeah, and an actual rock star. Rock, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, he was I was gonna I was asked to interview him at Birmingham Waterstones last month, but I couldn't do it because I was I was uh well I was in Greece. I'm gonna mention it again. <laughs> <laughs> um Yes. Oh, this this whole author gig, Chris Carter or Greece. I mean, oh, just tough in it. I don't know. <laughs> I know, but I mean, you're quite good at it. But I find it quite hard interviewing people. I um, I interviewed Alex Michaelides in front of like a hundred of his most adoring fans, and and none of them were there to see me. They were all just like his fans. <laughs> And um, yeah, it was, I found it quite hard. I mean, I, I did, um, it went, it was getting started was the hard, once, I got, once I'd started and I'd been doing it for one, for a couple of minutes and I'd got my first laugh, then it was fine. Um, but yeah, I, I prefer um, being the one answering the questions or being like on a panel with a few people kind of chatting, like doing that. So yeah. Well, that's my, because cause my book came out last month and there were like a few people wanted to interview me. And part of me was terrified because I've asked some people some horrible questions and I thought they're all going to want to get their revenge. And also right. I just hate 
just being like the person that's in the spotlight so I'm like, oh. but it was fine and everyone was lovely so it was fine <laughs> yeah well there congratulations on the book thank you are you right have you got another one on the way um i've sort of finished writing the second one and then i'm but um i plan to write a series and i didn't write the second one in the series because i didn't have an idea i started writing it as the second one in the series and it didn't work okay. so i had to take the characters out and put different ones in so oh. now i'm writing the second in the series and I'm okay. like 20 odd thousand words in now. So, yeah, my publisher basically told me you have to. Because <laughs> all the reviews pretty much say we want to read the next one, which is kind of my own fault. So I left it on a bit of a cliffhanger. So, right. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. It's quite that's... nice. It's been awesome. I get it now. I get why you people do it. <laughs> because I always thought authors were mental. But now I, I understand completely. It's amazing fun as well yeah it is it is it is so um so if you were able to spend a day with any author dead or alive who would you like to spend a day with um <laughs> oh my god well i mean that's hard because some of my my favorite writers i don't know whether they'd be fun to hang out with um <laughs> i my favorite my kind of hero is <laughs> Uh, or heroine is Donna Tartt who wrote The Secret History which I've mentioned and I also really love Brett Easton Ellis who wrote American Psycho um, and they they are kind of like my two apart from Stephen King and they're my two kind of main literary heroes but I mean I know loads of authors and I hang out with loads of authors all the time so I really I would just say my friends who are who are yeah. authors um <laughs> Yeah. If you have a fanboy over anyone you've met yet, yeah. Um, well, I did meet Donna Tart at a book signing. I was just like a customer. I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, it wasn't as writer to writer. I was queuing up to to get a book signed, and I said to her that it was my favourite book ever, and she shook my hand, and I was like, "Oh my god, I've never washed my hand again." <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, I've met, I've met loads of like, I met, uh, I've met Lee Child a few times and he never remembers who I am like the next time I meet him, but it's fine. <laughs> I'm expecting <him> to. <laughs> um, who else? Uh, I mean, I've met some, I've, I've met most of the UK crime writers and they're all really lovely. I've, I met, you know, Jane Harper, the Australian writer. I really, really love her books. And John Mars and I saw her at Harrogate a few years ago. We were like, oh, we want to go. John was like, come on, let's just go and say hello to her. And we were like two little kind of <laughs> little boys going up to say, <laughs> we really love your books. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's the first, that's the only time I've kind of done that. Um, normally, I, I'm just, I'll, I just kind of chat chat to anyone without feeling that it's like a thing. But yeah, I've like Linwood Barkley I've met and he was really great. There's a few there is a few people who I would find a bit intimidating who um I've seen them kind of at festivals, especially like in America, and I thought, oh, they're too they're too famous and like Harlan Cove, for example, I, I, I saw, I kind of stood near him and I was like, I'm a bit too shy. To <laughs> I also met Michael Connolly, who is like the first crime writer that I really loved in the nineties. And it was actually excruciating because um, he's actually a really, he's really shy. Um, and I was introduced to him and I just couldn't think of anything to say apart from, I don't know, I love your books or something, would do something pathetic <laughs> or something about the room we were in. I can't, I can't, I've actually blanked how I say because it was so embarrassing. <laughs> and then he just stood there and didn't really say anything. And I was like, oh my God, I just want to the ground to swallow me up. This is, <laughs> this is so painful. So I just <laughs> shuffled away. <laughs> I went and talked to somebody else. <laughs> oh my God, I'm actually breaking out in a cold sweat thinking about it. Yeah, that was the worst. <laughs> That was the worst author encounter I've had. No, it was nothing. It wasn't his fault. It was just like, 
I just couldn't meet him on a kind of like peer level. It was like he, you're too famous and too too successful. I I was just like, and he's he didn't kind of he doesn't make you feel at ease by like being chatty like Lee Child or someone. He's just like, yeah, hmm? that's partly his fault. He should be more. No, well, I think he's just, he, I mean, I wouldn't, I, you can't blame him if he's got all these people kind of being dragged up to him to be introduced to him. He wasn't rude or anything. He was perfectly pleasant. It was, I felt like I, I, sh I should have come up with something more interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway. Maybe you'll get another chance to redeem yourself one day. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> I'm sure oh. he's forgotten anyway, so it's fine. Oh yeah, he won't have, he definitely won't remember. He definitely won't remember. He probably yeah. meets a hundred people a night of these things. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so talking of festivals, where will we find you over the next few months? Well, I'm not I w so I'm gonna be at Harrogate, but just as a as a kind of punter, I'll just be there. I'm doing two festivals later this year. I'm doing uh, Chilton Kills, which I think is the first weekend of October, and I will be in charge of the karaoke again this year, like last year, <laughs> me and Ed James. Uh, and then I'm doing the one in Shoreham, um, which is also in October. Um, and I think I'm doing the quiz at that, running the quiz. So yeah, it's great. It's great being asked to do these fun, these fun things, not just like being on a panel. Yeah, so I'm excited about both of those. Um, I should yeah, be at both. <laughs> I should be at all three, actually. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah, I'm having, a re I'm having a relatively quiet year this year in terms of events and things. Um, I'm doing one in Birmingham this Saturday, actually, the National Writers Conference, which is for writers and, like, aspiring writers. And I've got to give the keynote speech, which I haven't written yet. <laughs> so I'm do that this week. Um, yeah, well, it's only Monday. It's fine. You got loads of time. <laughs> yeah, I got four days. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that that's it for uh, for this year. And then I I expect next year when the wasp trap comes out, I'll be doing a lot more. Hopefully. Oh yes, I think we'll be very busy. <laughs> yes. Yes. So is that is that the end of our chat? We've yes. been going for an hour. We've been going for an hour. I can't believe it. I know. Actually, I mean, to be fair, I could ask you loads more questions, but I imagine, like me, you want to go watch the football. So I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very keen also to finish and go watch the football. <laughs> Although okay. I'm not sure which game to watch. I might flick at half time. But then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Spain don't need the points, do they? I can't remember. Oh uh, yeah. Italy do. So maybe watch the Italy match. Yeah, know. good point. Um, so <laughs> I want to remind everyone about the new book and where they can get it from and where they can find you. Um, it's called The Darkest Water. It's available on Amazon. Um, you can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, or Instagram as Mark Edwards Author. Um, and on Twitter, slash X, I am <laughs> Mr. Edwards. And that's Mark Richard Edwards, not Mr. Edwards. <laughs> thinks it is. <laughs> it's really annoying because Mark Edwards' author is one character too long for Twitter for my username, so I can't be that on there. And it's <laughs> if Elon does one thing on Twitter, it would be to make us have slightly longer, allow us to have slightly longer usernames, but there's no <laughs> sign of that yet. No. <laughs> no. No. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And once it's, it's done, it seems, then I'll share it and stuff everywhere. And enjoy the okay. <laughs> Thank you, you too. It's been fun. I'll see you yeah. at Harrogate. Yes, brilliant. Take care. Okay. All right. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>